big sale, big savings at oldtimeradiodvd.com. All of our collections, the prices have been slashed. Pricing will be good until January the 1st, 2018, so don't wait. Buy today and enjoy for a lifetime at oldtimeradiodvd.com. You'll be glad you did. The Civil Servant, a species worthy of closer examination. Juggling all those application forms, rules and regulations, bylaws, codes. What would we do without them? Take, for instance, a man like Adrian Toop. He's about to slip through a hole in his comfortable rut, a special kind of vanishing point. <laughs> It all seemed a perfectly normal evening for Adrian Toop. He battled his way home through rush hour traffic and gusts of snow, cursing moderately. Once there he was, as always, greeted warmly by his loving wife, Marianne. Hi, honey. I'm home. So, how was your day? Oh, same as usual. Busy as hell. It's getting worse. They should give you a raise if this keeps up. <laughs> Try telling them that. And I save them thousands of dollars every week. Say, where's the kids? Aren't they watching cartoons? I've lit the fire in the living room and the martinis are chilled. Oh, you spoil me. Do you know that? <laughs> you deserve it. Cooped up in that horrible office all day. Yeah, you know... It's amazing the way people try to cheat the system. It's anarchy oh, out there. It's so nice to see such harmony in a rancorous world. Well, after a satisfying meal of chicken cacciatore, washed down with a glass or two of rough but warming Italian wine, the family settled down to watch a little wow, television. there's not much left of him after that. Oh, he'll get out of it. You'll see. He's got to finish off the villain, hasn't he? Oh, I worry sometimes. <laughs> that violence. It's unnatural. Oh, it's harmless enough. Oh, oh watch out! Ah. Oh, that's scary, Dad. Let's watch something else. Oh, Michael, they're actors, that's all. It's an illusion. It fades at the flick of a switch. Bobby, Bobby! Well, that isn't an illusion. It's your turn for the story tonight, Adrian. No rest for the wicked. That's what they say. The typical family evening, isn't it? Enacting a scenario duplicated by millions across the continent. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. <laughs> That's very good, Andrea. What story would you like tonight? The night Max wore his wolf suit. Yes, Daddy, that one, that one. Okay, you lie back then. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind or another, his mother called him Wild Thing and sent him to his room without any supper. Later that night, he settled back in his twin bed, separated from his wife by an antique reading table upon which reposed an elegant brass reading lamp. And, uh, after, uh... Um, too, Adrian. <laughs> He drifted off into the sleep of the satisfied and the just. At about three in the morning, he was awakened by some indefinable sound. <laughs> oh, I'm imagining things. Oh, God, I feel awful. The wine. Uh, too rough. Now, where are those Rolades? <sighs> what? What? I can't find the table. The light. What the hell is going on? Marianne? Marianne? At that moment, he became aware of a growing, almost evanescent light. And behind it, as if in white cloud, were several shapes, human but not yet distinguishable. The light increased, and the figures swam into focus. There were three women. He recognized the types and what appeared to be a judge sitting on a raised bench. Of Marianne, there was no sign. In fact, he wasn't in his bedroom at all, and yet he was most certainly in his bed, trapped in his bed. He could sit up, but otherwise not move, as if held by invisible chains. Everything else, so loved, so familiar, so cherished, had vanished into thin air. 
That's him. That's the man. He's responsible. Are you absolutely sure, Mrs. Weber? Now look again. That is only right and proper. That, after all, is justice. Ask Ruth. She knows him too, don't you, Ruth? Know him? I hate him. My daughter's ruined because of him, the bastard. And Rachel. Now she'll never forget him or forgive him. My youngest died because of him. I curse him every time I go to my little one's grave. My husband is in jail because of him. My husband left because of him. The rest of my babies are in homes because of him. Crucify him. Terry's eyes out. Castrate him. Castrate him. For God's sake, what is this all about? Oh, one second time, Mr. Tube. Ladies, ladies, please, uh, restrain yourself. This is not a kangaroo court. Court? And you are hardly doing your cause a service by behaving frankly like the Furies of old. Chain him to the rock. I want his guts. Hard. Oh, you'd never find it. Give him to us now. Silence. Silence. From the depositions you have made, it would appear that you do indeed have cause. But it must be clearly determined. And Mr. Tope must be allowed to speak in his own defense. Now, prisoner at the bar. Prisoner? Bar? Are you all mad? I'm at home. Home in my bed. You are in one sense at home in your bed. However, in another you are not. As you can see if you look about you. Now, Adrian Troop. It is Adrian, isn't it? It is. Now, would you please tell me what this is all about? Ah, everyone is so impatient these days. There's no time, it seems, for the gentlemanly exercise of jurisprudence. Ah, oh, get on with it, oh, Charles. Right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Adrian. You are charged here with numerous crimes against humanity. Too many to itemize, but for our purposes, we have selected three witnesses, these ladies here. What crimes? This is preposterous. I'm a highly respected civil servant, a Rotarian, a lion, a happily married man with two children. Yes, 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 we know all that. But the fact remains, I'm afraid, that you personally have been accused of being the agent responsible for administering suffering and misery to thousands. Accused? But I don't know them. Not by sight, any of them. Are they... Have they been clients of mine? Clients? Well, you would use that word. Victims is more like it. He's as guilty as hell. Can't we just kill him and get it over with? Yes, let let this, let look, let let look, you can't do this. I'm just a supervisor at the welfare office, that's all. I obey ministry regulations. I dispense money to the poor and needy fairly when it's deserved. Oh, you don't know what's fair. Fair. I just do what I'm paid to do. That's all. Order. Order in this court, I say. Order. Good. <clears throat> now, once again, prisoner at the bar. I'm in bed. Can't you see that I'm trapped in my bed? Oh, have it your own way, prisoner in the bed. How do you plead, guilty or not guilty? Oh, the, this is a, a dream, isn't it? A, a, a nightmare. I'll wake up in a minute. Get up quietly so as not to wake Marianne and, and make myself a cup of tea. Yes, that's it. Tea and a couple of aspirins should clear this up. If as much as all life is a dream, Adrian, you are correct again. Row, row, row your boat gently. Now, how do you plead? Gently down the street. <laughs> Poor Adrian. Trapped in that world halfway between sleep and reality, the purgatory of the subconscious, the dark from which all true nightmares spring, he felt that his ordeal was not going to end until he had pandered to these absurd figments of his imagination. The judge with his grey beard and rheumy eyes, the vengeful women, vultures. 
He tried for what seemed to be an eternity to blot out the picture, to force himself to wake, but the images wouldn't go away. They waited in grim All right. silence for his reply. All right. I don't see why I should plead at all, but I'll play the game. Not guilty, Your Honor. Oh, thank you for your cooperation, Adrian. <clears throat> Let me see. Uh, now, Mrs. Webb, in this court it is not necessary to go through the formality of the oath. I want this recorded. I've never seen this woman before in no, my life. No, but I've seen you in your pinstripe suit behind the smoke glass doors of your office. Oh, yes, I've seen you. All of you want more than the law allows, and most of you lie to try and get it. And you don't have to lie about anything, do you? Driving your fancy car and stubborn your face with fancy food and stubborn your fancy wife whenever you feel... Hey, hey you wait a minute. You can't talk about that. I say, I say. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Webb, when was the last time you had dealings with Mr. Tooper? Well, Your Honor, it was Monday of this week. Yes, I remember it was Monday because it rained just after I put me wash out. But I left it because I had to get the number four of us to get down to the welfare office. Yes? Oh, no, oh, it's you again, Mrs. Webb. I thought we dealt with you last week. Uh, so you did. Uh, let's see your file. Uh, yeah, that's it. Payments reduced from three forty a month to two hundred and ten. Reason: husband earning undeclared income. He was working in a bar for tips. That's all tips. It's still income, Mrs. Webb, as as Mr. Toop said. Yes. Well, but that don't matter now. I filled out another application, see? Me husband's in jail. Jail? What for? That's not your business, is it? Now, if I can get me old rate back, as he's not around to earn extra income... Uh, I'm not sure we can do that, Mrs. Webb. Uh, wait there, will you? While I go and check with the supervisor. Mr. Toot? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Toot. I saw him... As clear as I can see you, Your Honor. He took me form and tore it up. Didn't even read it. And the clerk come back and said, in front of everybody, I couldn't believe my ears. Your husband is being supported by the state in prison, Mrs. Webb. And Mr. Toop feels that in those circumstances, your payments are adequate. Adequate? Four kids at home, rent to pay, and the price of food out of sight... Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Webb. You may step down. Uh, did you tear up her application, Adrian? Of course I did. Her husband had been earning undeclared income a lot. Now, that's not allowed, and both of them knew it. And when he got jailed for theft, well, the act is very specific about jailed husbands. I know that. I have it here. Uh, in no way, however, must the wife or family be held responsible for the husband's misdemeanor or be made to suffer for his offense. Each case must be reviewed with scrupulous fairness on its individual merits. Oh, that's what it says, yes. yes. But it's a political cover-up, that's all. Now, if I chose to increase everyone's allowance whose husband was in jail, I'd lose my job. You are telling me that you are not allowed to exercise any human prerogative? Compassion, for instance? How can I expect you to understand? There are thousands of Mrs. Webbs out there. And they're all starving to hear them talk. She and her family have been a burden on the public purse for years. I see, I see. And it's your job to act as a guardian of the public interest, as you understand it. To an extent, yes. In any case, there was a memorandum from the minister, a direct order. Yes, I have that here somewhere, too. We'll come to that later. Next witness, please. Your turn, Rachel. No, oh, dear, you go first. Oh, no, 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 you go. Oh, come, come, make up your mind, ladies. Time is running out. Right then, I'll, I'll, I'll go. <clears throat> now, you are... Uh... Mrs. Rachel White, uh, Your Honor. Uh, yes, yes, here we are. <clears throat> now, you claim that this man was personally responsible for your daughter's death and the subsequent removal of your remaining children to foster homes. He was, Your Honor. Now, I, I, I want you to think very carefully, my dear. This is a very serious charge. And it can't be upheld. 
It was a clear-cut example of malnutrition and neglect, one of the worst cases I've ever seen. Now, you were lucky to escape criminal charges. It's all lies. I love my children from the baby. What happened to the baby? Something in the blood it was. And the medicine was so expensive. Seventy dollars a week. Well, first off, the welfare paid for it all, but... But then... But then you got a job. Now, it's as simple as that. You couldn't expect us to pay for the medicine once you got a job. I personally bent over backwards to be reasonable in your case. Too reasonable, if you ask me. We did not ask you, Adrian, and I'd be pleased if you could restrain yourself until your time comes for rebuttal. <clears throat> Go on, Rachel. It's true what they said. I just couldn't look after them like I used to. And my husband... He was out all day looking for work. Work? Drinking? That's what he was doing. It's our job to know these things. So what if he did take a drop on occasions? Poor devil. There was little enough to keep him at home. And precious little outside it. Uh, the baby, Rachel. What happened to the baby? I had to cut her medicine a bit. And one time I woke up. And she wasn't breathing. She was too frail to begin with. And her little heart... Oh. For God's sake, Judge, let her go now. She said enough. More than enough, poor soul. You, you may step down, Rachel. There, there, dear. Have the oh, bit of right gum. Now. Oh, it's oh, great right. for the cry and a bit of gum. Well, Adrian. It's a tragic story, I admit. I feel very sorry for her. It must be an awful thing to go through life with that on her conscience. After all, I'm not a monster. I have feelings. I do, I tell you. I reviewed her case with great care. It was obvious to me that the child should have been hospitalized, should have been under permanent medical supervision. I wrote and told her so, but she refused to give the baby up. And her foolish doctor led her to believe that she could handle the problem on her own. And to make matters worse, her husband used to drink her money away. Now, you can't expect a welfare agency to subsidize people's vices. You like a drink on occasions, I believe. What was it tonight? Two martinis and a bottle of wine? The comparison isn't just ridiculous, it's odious. You are a public servant. We must bear that in mind. Have you anything else to say about the accusation of Rachel White? No. You've got a copy of the folder there. The facts speak for themselves, and she's virtually admitted that she's an unfit mother. It's all meticulously researched, every detail. Except for the human factor. There is an element of doubt in this case. But whereas Mrs. White was not in a position to exercise good sound judgment, you were. You still wish to stand by your decision on your case? Yes, I do. I've nothing to be ashamed of. Very well. Mrs. Ruth Pardy? Here, Your Honor. Uh, there are several complaints here. Uh, deserted by husband. Daughter becoming a prostitute. How old is your daughter, Ruth? Thirteen, Your Honor. Thirteen? My God, that's awful. Listen to him, as if he cares. Well, I My do care. Now, I had no idea. Where the hell else do you think we got the money? You bastard. Now, now, silence. Silence, all of you. You may continue, Ruth, but please confine your remarks to me. Yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry. It was the back payments that did it. Back payments? Well, if they overpay you, you've got to pay it back. You see... After my husband left, well, I didn't tell them, the department. I was in debt to everybody, and without his money, well, we couldn't survive, that's all. There you are, by your own admission, a liar and a cheat. If I was cheating, it was out of necessity. Oh, that's what they all say. Surely, Your Honor, you can see that there's no charge here. I'm just not allowed to pay support money for somebody who isn't there. It's ludicrous. Oh, I understand that, Adrian. <clears throat> Go on. He wrote me and said if I didn't pay the 340 overpayment within four weeks, I'd go to jail. Well, I was terrified. They take the youngsters everything. My eldest, Patricia, saw I was desperate, crying all day. Well, I couldn't stop. Uh, go on. Well, she got to stay out late, 
with friends, she said. Then one day, she come in with the money. I knew then. If you knew, for God's sake, why did you take the money? I had to. You told me. But I didn't mean you wouldn't have been jailed. That's just a form letter, that's all. A, a device to shake people up, scare them into paying what they should never have received. Fear is a device? It's standard practice everywhere, and you know it. But what she did, I, I'm horrified. Can you imagine anything more reprehensible than living off your teenage daughter's earnings as a prostitute? Now, I'm not responsible for that. Well, that's not for you to say, Adrian. Or me, for that matter. There's someone else here who will decide. Who? I, I don't see... Hello, Adrian. Marianne. Oh, thank goodness. A sane voice at last. Are, are the children all right? They're fine. Of, of course they're fine. <laughs> We're not here really, are we? Neither one of us. Oh... Oh, God, this is absurd. I've got to wake up. The damned wine, that's what it was. I'll never buy that rubbish again. It wasn't the wine, Adrian. I'm being accused of unspeakable crimes I didn't commit. Harassed by a bunch of... Oh, damn, I think I'm losing my mind. How, how did you get here anyway? I was called. Women. Voices. I was called, and I woke up, and I came. Did you hear enough? I heard everything. Then it's up to you now. Is it? You may plead for him or against him, according to the truth in your heart. But Marianne... Wait, Adrian. I see now how horribly efficient you really are. The suffering of others means nothing to you. You treat your clients as if they were players in a, a never-ending TV show, as, as if they were all illusions. Illusions that you can dismiss at the flick of a switch. For God's sake! <laughs> I just do the job I'm paid to do. I follow orders, instructions. He's got one of them there from the minister. Why don't you read it? Hmm? Well, go on. Very well. To all department heads, urgent. Social welfare spending must be decreased by $8 million in the next fiscal year. You are advised to take all necessary measures to affect economies and root out abuses. <laughs> there you are, Marianne. See, if anyone's responsible, the minister is. That's a direct order. And there is implicit in this document a very hidden incitement to enact harsh and brutal measures. <laughs> exactly. I... However... The choices you made were rapid, direct, and stamped with your own individual decisions. I don't deny that. So, you consider that you have done no wrong. Quite the reverse. I'm a public servant, paid to be a moral force in a world in which every layabout and bomb expects to be supported in luxury by the state. Now, why don't you ask the great mass of decent working people out there what they think? They'll whistle a few of them up here, and, and you'll find they'll back me up 100%. It's their taxes I'm saving. Well, see? <laughs> that shuts your ladies up, hasn't it? They're waiting, Adrian. That's all. Waiting? For what? The judgment. Well, Mrs. Stoop, the problem is quite complex. There is little doubt that your husband was, technically at least, acting within the guidelines laid down by his department. He himself was, to some extent, of it. <laughs> Sense at last. He was, however, free to exercise certain moral choices which would have helped rather than hurt the poor who were literally in his care. It is this question of moral responsibility you have to address. I find my husband morally responsible and therefore guilty as charged. What? But Marianne, you haven't heard a word. Not a lot of thing I've said. Guilty yes, as charged. No, no. Yes. Guilty. Okay. Guilty. You're, guilty. You're insane. Every one of you. You too, Marianne. Guilty. Well, what do you propose to do to me, eh? Guilty. What punishment can you conjure up to fit the crime? Guilty. <laughs> I, I suppose you're going to snap your fingers and spirit me away, huh? There, I, I was right in the first place. Yes. You're nothing but shadows. Figments of my imagination. There. There, look at you. You're disappearing already. Oh, go on. Shoo. Finish. There. There. They're all gone. Well, 
thank God. Oh. 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 I just have to wake up in a minute and get ready for work. Yes. It's a difficult job. Not without its moments of stress. But someone has got to do it on behalf of the others. The God-fearing. The hard-working. The righteous. Oh. oh, yes. I must will myself to wake up. It must be time. Time. And indeed it was time. While their comfortable counterparts stirred to the bubble of bedside coffee machines, the poor denizens of the jungle that was the city hacked and coughed and mourned their way into the light. I'm gone, Not at the toop house, however. Your lunch can. Not gone. there. Have a good day. I'm in school. You must be crazy. Bye, Andrea. Bye. <sighs> One... Uh, hello, Department of Social Welfare. Uh, this is Mrs. Toop. Oh, Mr. Reed, good morning. Yes, that's what I was calling about. My husband appears to have gone, Mr. Reed, sometime in the middle of the night. Uh, yes. No, 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 no conversation, no warning. He appears to have deserted me, I'm afraid. Yes, I will call the police, but I don't hold out much hope. Oh, by the way, will I be eligible to file for welfare until I can get myself a job? I am. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll come straight to you with the application. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Come on, Andrea. You can watch Sesame Street. Life is but a dream. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a Abandonment is such a reprehensible crime. I hope the powers that be will treat your case with the compassion it deserves. Hmm. No note, you say? Not a trace? The circumstances are, well, to say the least, a bit odd. I'm afraid they may find Adrian's desertion to be outside of their jurisdiction. The fact is... The welfare office doesn't recognize the vanishing point. The Bailiff and the Women by Michael Cook. Tom Macbeth was heard as Adrian Toop, Anna Hagen as Marianne Toop, Sky Murray as Baby Toop, Jason Micus as Michael Toop, Jimmy Johnston as the Judge, Gillian Newman, Donna Peerless, and Betty Phillips as the three women, and Alex Dyken as the clerk with Peter Hayworth as the host. Technical operations were by Jerry Stanley, with sound effects by Joe Silva. Original music was composed and arranged by Bill Skolnick. The series script editor for Vanishing Point is Sandra Rabinovich. The original musical theme is by John Roby. And the voice of introduction is David Calderisi. The Bailiff and the Women was produced and directed at CBC Vancouver by John Giuliani. The executive producer of Vanishing Point is William Lane. Next week, don't miss Quickening, a harrowing new play by Judith Thompson, the author of the acclaimed Crackwalker, starring Nancy Park and Michael Hogan. That's Quickening, next week on Vanishing Point. Until then, I'm Art Cuthbert, wishing you good night. <laughs>